Hey, shalom everyone. Good evening from the Judean hills in between Jerusalem on the mountains and the Mediterranean Sea right on the west. We are in a beautiful location, a place called Yad Hashmona, where only Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers, but believers in Yeshua lives. And we are here to celebrate with you one of the most important events in the calendar of the Jewish people. I want to uh, welcome all of you to our uh, Zoom uh, uh, conversation or, or event here. And I can clearly see hundreds of uh, people um, from all around the world. I've got a big screen. I don't know if you can see it, but maybe you can see now. Right in front of me, I've got a camera, but on the left, I've got a big screen and I can see you. Don't think that I cannot see you. I can see all of you, and I can see you, from, you know, with the tables that you have prepared and uh, everything. So I am extremely blessed to see people. By the way, we've got people from uh, nearly 50 different countries, uh, all together around 1,000 families that have, uh, uh, they, they were fast enough to register to this very limited chat room, uh, but we are also live on Facebook and YouTube right now. And for those of you that are watching us on Facebook and on YouTube, a very warm welcome, uh, although it's quite freezing here. And um, I would like to welcome all of you to this very unique and first of a kind broadcast uh, of Behold Israel. So I, I would like to uh, start this evening with a, a prayer, but not before I will interact with a few of you. I see Michael and Krista from Germany that are here with us. I'm going to uh, unmute you and uh, you can uh, say maybe a, a word or two. Uh, Michael and Krista, you are from Germany. Can Toyota me malamasach? Yeah. And um, there you go. I'm asking you to unmute, and you can unmute yourself. Shalom. Wie geht es euch? Shalom. Danke schön. Ja. Also, ähm, wir freuen uns, dass wir an dieser äh, Passover teilnehmen dürfen. And uh, that's German. Uh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> we are happy to be with you, with uh, brothers and sisters from uh, all over the world. We Thank are you. very amazing about uh, have the community with you and to hear God's word and uh, have community in Christ Jesus together. Yes, amen. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Have this time. Thank you. Yeah. Herzlich willkommen. Um, what yeah, about... <laughs> I see Nico and Marike. Nico and Marike. Uh, Shalom. I can see you on the screen. Can you unmute yourself? And we're going to say, we're going to ask you, where are you from, Nico and Marike? We are from Holland. From Holland, Netherlands. the Netherlands. Welcome. Yes. Ach so, wonderful. Um, I, I, I can see that your table is set and we are very, very yes. excited about it. So um, we're happy to have you here. What about Kylie uh, Ferguson? I see the Fergusons here. Can you unmute yourself? And uh, where are you from? Hi, uh, we're from Salem, Oregon, USA. From the United States. Beautiful, wonderful. Yeah. How, what's the time right now over there? Um, it's 8.04. 8 o'clock. Yep. Wonderful. So you woke up early just for this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to start with a prayer right now, and we'll jump right into our very busy schedule with a wonderful wonderful presentation. So Father, we thank you so much that you, you declare the end from the beginning. You want your children to know you and to understand your wonderful plan of salvation that you demonstrated 2,000 years ago through the Messiah. And all of those beautiful symbols that are here right before us today are a wonderful picture of your heart to save this the world that uh, is all around us. But of course, Father, we ask that uh, through this broadcast today, you will prepare the hearts, you will change them, and you will draw people unto you. 
We thank you and we bless you in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, the Messiah, the Redeemer, of which all the prophets talked and uh, prophesied. In the name of Yeshua, we pray, Amen and Amen. So, again, Shalom everyone. Today with me, I've got Yaron Cherniak, and he will be with me uh, doing the musical part of this evening. Authentic songs written by him, composed by him. In fact, most of the lyrics are from the scriptures, but uh, we made sure that the lyrics will fit to what we are going to do today. Uh, we're going to hear from your own um, right after I will talk about the different symbols that are right here before us. And then later on, when we reach at the point in the Passover Seder, that, pa that portion of the praise, the Hallel, Yaron will sing a couple more songs for us. Yaron, by the way, is part of the Mikedim a, um, group, uh, and they have wonderful albums. You can find them all uh, around the social media, and he, he's going to say a few more things later on. We are going to start with this, and I'm super excited about it because this is, this is why I'm sitting right here as a Jew from the tribe of Judah in the Judean hills. This is the tribe of Judah's territory right here. We're next to the border of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, and behind me further down is the tribe of Dan, and we are definitely in a biblical location. We're about a mile and a half, less than that actually, from the road to Emmaus, that famous road where two disciples 2,000 years ago on that Sunday morning, after the resurrection, they walked out of Jerusalem on their way down to Emmaus. They were confused, they were angry, they were sad, and they were very frustrated. All their hopes for a reigning Messiah that will put an end to the Roman Empire and rule and reign from Jerusalem came, come, came tumbling down, basically. All they watched is a terrible picture of a crucified person that was taken later on into a tomb, and they heard the rumor that the tomb on Sunday morning was already empty. They did not understand. They did not comprehend. They had no understanding. And then, of course, as they were walking on that road, Jesus appeared, the resurrected Lord, and he asked them, what are those things that you talk about and you are so sad? And they said, what things? And, uh, and of course, he talked. He said, the, the things that you talk about. And they started telling him how much they were hoping that Jesus would be that Messiah that they you know, had in mind. And then he said to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets have said. And starting with Moses and Psalms and the prophets, he expounded everything that is concerning him. And that is the beautiful thing. What happened here 2,000 years ago, just behind me, is the revelation of the Messiah in the Old Testament to two confused, angry, frustrated, and helpless and hopeless uh, disciples. And of course, once they saw him there, once they understood him there, they were so amazed and they changed in a way that that same night, they turn around and they walk back to Jerusalem. That road was a road of victory, of hope, of future, and of great joy. And this is why we're here. Now, it's interesting because in the book of Romans, when Paul wrote uh, to that church in Rome, he's never been to Rome at the point, and he still, he writes them 16 packed chapters with unbelievable, unbelievable truths. And then he reached the last few verses of the last chapter, and he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known 
to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To that God, to Him alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So we can clearly see the Messiah was a mystery until that moment. It was a mystery that was kept a secret and hidden from every person, to the Jews and to the Gentiles alike. Although the scriptures were there, they didn't see him. And once he opened it, and those two disciples realized that's him, everything changed. And this is exactly why 2,000 years later, just on the same road, I can sit here, look straight to a camera, and speak to the nations all around the world. Hundreds of you, or families that are right now on this Zoom call, and thousands that are on Facebook and YouTube are watching right now, that which God meant for you to watch and understand. And that is why I call it the Messiah in the Passover Seder. So why don't we start? We, first of all, I want you to understand that in, uh, in the Bible it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are what? A shadow of things to come, but the substance is the Messiah. He says, everything that you see here, every single holiday, festival, Sabbath, new moon, everything is just a shadow of but the substance is the Messiah. And this is why in, in, in Luke, when we read about the, um, how the Messiah um, came with his disciples, it, but the Bible says in Luke chapter 22 and verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the, 12, the 12 apostles were with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling the disciples, everything that we're about to do is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In other words, do not make these things, the important thing, these are just the shadow. I am the substance. And, uh, you know, throughout the, the scriptures, he tried to tell them that quite a few times. I'm looking at the, in John chapter 6, when, when he, he told everyone something that was very hard for them to digest. He said, he said to them in verse 47, uh, he said, surely, uh, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If anyone eats of, it, of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. He started talking about his body that has to be broken, his flesh that has to be offered already in the very beginning. He started talking and giving them a message that was so hard for them. Then the Bible says, after he said all of that, and look at this, he said, um, uh, here it is. In verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard that, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And of course, many people we know just left. And he was left with only those who were willing to hear. This evening is called the Passover Seder. Seder in Hebrew is a word that is basically order. There's no mess here. There's an order here. There's no mess. When God created this world, we create the mess. We bring so much chaos, instability, 
because of our sinful nature. When He created this world, it was good. It was very good. But then, of course, everything took a very different turn of events in chapter 3 of the first book of the Bible. But it's interesting because that Seder, that order, that thing which we are about to do, is a traditional thing. We don't really read in the Old Testament of everything that is on this table today. We hear of the matzah bread, the unleavened bread, the Passover uh, sacrifice, and we hear about the bitter herbs. These are the three things that we know the Scriptures commanded the people of Israel to be able to eat every Passover as they remember those days that they left Egypt and how God, with His outstretched hand, brought them from the land of bondage and slavery into that amazing, amazing freedom. Uh, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, They shall take some of the blood and put it in the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then they shall eat the flesh of that, on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. These are the three things that we're commanded to eat. Then, of course, this whole evening is not just about eating. In fact, I know that eating, there's no way we can celebrate any festival without food. But eating is a remembrance of something. But the most important thing is the telling. And telling is Haggadah, Lehagid, to tell. That's why we call the booklet that consists, uh, that uh, has all the order of the Seder, we call it Haggadah. And it includes, of course, um, all this story and all the things that we need to do in order to remember it. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 13, verse 8, You shall tell your son in that day, saying, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. For every Jew in the history, there is that commandment to tell his son and his, his children, basically. This was done to me when I came from Egypt. Interesting. The first generation went through the wilderness. Of course, most of the generation passed before they entered the land, if you remember that. Everyone from age 20 and above. But we know that that was supposed to be remembered for generations. Here we are, three, um, almost 3,500 years later, and we're still celebrating the same thing. But thankfully, today, we can see the shadow and we can believe in the substance. Now, it has to be very clear that in that telling section, we don't only read the story, but we also um, do, uh, we, we sing praise songs. And that is known as the Hallel. These are Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And Passover is also the only festival which the Hallel is said at night. Normally in the temple, in the other festivals, they used to do the Hallel, the praise, during the day. The story, it's interesting, as we read in Deuteronomy 26, you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, and few in number, and there he became a nation. That's, of course, uh, Abraham, and mighty and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. And then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. That's what we're going to do. That's what we've been doing for the last 3,500 years. We're telling our children, we're telling our offsprings, that that God of our fathers is a God that is keeping His promises and is a God that is hearing the prayers and is a God 
that is not forgetting his nation Israel. The Bible says, I am God and I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed or sons of Jacob. He is God. He cannot change. And that's why the nation of Israel is still here. I'm here. Yaron is here. We are two Jewish people that represent tonight before you the nation of Israel that is still alive. Here we are. 73 years ago, the nation was reestablished here, back in the land, back on the map. We're celebrating independence in just a few weeks. And here we are. The God of Israel once again shows to the whole world that He is a, a God that fulfills His promises. Now, as I said, there is that book called Haggadah. It's a collection of things that um, from the last, uh, I guess, 1500 years or so, in the time of Jesus, we do not know about that specific book in existence. We know that Jesus told His disciples that He is longing to eat the Passover. He didn't talk about all the rest of the things. But of course, we know that when we examine what they did that evening, we know that they followed a specific ceremony that much of it is still being done today. Now, I would like to, um, to continue and, and show you a certain number of things here on this beautiful Passover plate. We've got the shank bones, we've got the roasted egg, we've got bitter herbs, we've got haroset, which is the mixture that is reminding us of mud for the mud bricks. And of course, we've got the matzah bread, we've got wine, we've got salt water, and we've, you know, as you can see, every single thing that is here is a reflection of either the Messiah himself or that which he has done. And um, the shank bone, the shank bone, as uh, we all know, look, every Jewish group has its own shank bone. Some are putting smaller ones, some are putting bigger ones, some will show you. I mean, I, I, I brought this little thing here. Don't laugh at me. I'm here in the, in the middle of nowhere and it's, I'm not in the house. But I want to tell you, the shank bone is, of course, a symbol of the Passover lamb that was sacrificed on that evening. And of course, remember, they ate from its, uh, uh, from its uh, flesh and uh, the bone just left. Now today, there is no temple in Jerusalem. The Jewish people cannot sacrifice the Passover lamb and eat of it. Therefore, what we have here is just the bone itself, the shank bone. And uh, if you remember, first of all, this bone is not broken, which is super important. The shank bone is a symbol of the lamb, that lamb that was offered. I would like to take you back 2,000 years ago. In fact, I'll take you back to the time of the Exodus of a little lamb that the Bible said that God ordered the people of Israel to take into their house and to keep it for four days. Four days, I believe, uh, 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 they inspected it and they, they made sure that it is unblemished. And of course, on that, that was on the 10th day of the month. On the 14th day of the month, they had to kill it and use that blood to sprinkle it on the doorposts of, that, of their house. The Lord did not say to the angel that was about to kill the firstborns, Look for the Jews and see who they, where they are and pass over their house. The instruction was very clear. Pass over the house of those that have the blood sprinkled on their doorposts. And that is important. The only way we can have judgment passed over us, the only way we can not go through the wrath of God, the judgment of God, is when we apply the blood of that innocent lamb on the doorposts of our hearts. And it's interesting because during that night, I'm thinking about it. What if the Egyptians would have overheard the instructions that Moses gave to his people? You know, I believe that every Egyptian family that would have applied blood from that precious lamb on their doorposts, they would, their firstborns would be spared. 
But we know, again, it's not about affiliation. It's not about the blood that runs through your own veins. It's not about, you know, which ethnic groups you were born to. It's about the blood of an innocent lamb, not yours, but that which died for you, that which was the door for you to come out of slavery into or, or bondage into His wonderful light and freedom. And of course, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in the latter part of verse 7, Therefore, He says, Purge out the old leaven, and yet you may be a new lump, since truly are unleavened. And then He says, For indeed, Christ, the Messiah, Christos, our Passover was sacrificed for us. The Bible says, and this was written by an ultra-Orthodox Pharisee. This is written by someone who persecuted the church. This was written by someone who thought that anyone who believes in Yeshua in those days is a heretic. And yet when the scales fell down and the veil was lifted and he could have his eyes open up, he understood, okay, now finally understand what this whole meaning of Passover is. Now I know who was the true Passover. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. That Passover lamb, the Lamb of God, that one that John, when he saw him approaching him in the river Jordan, said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That same Passover lamb, he had to die. He had to die for us. There is no way for the Messiah to reign and rule in Jerusalem before He sacrificed Himself, before He offered Himself. That's why those disciples were so confused. I mean, a mile and a half from here, two people who saw Jesus for the last three years, who walked with Him, celebrated with Him, watched His miracles, saw everything He said at the money time when He offered Himself. And he died on that cross and then was crucified and resurrected on the third day. And they knew that the tomb is empty, still didn't get it. But then, of course, when he opened their eyes to understand him in the scriptures, when their eyes were open, they truly understood he had to die because he was the Passover. Exodus 12, 5 says, your lamb, these are the instructions, your lamb shall be without blemish. A year old male, you can take it from the sheep or from the goats. And in 1 Peter, we know. See, that's the shadow. And we look at the substance in 1 Peter, it says, But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. He fulfilled every criteria. Exodus 12, 46 says, In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. So this was offered for you. Don't break any of his bones. He has to be unblemished. And in John 19, verse 33, 33 it says, When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, those Roman soldiers, they did not break his legs. Normally to expedite death because of the holidays so they can obviously um, bury him before the, uh, that great Sabbath comes, they did not have to break any of his bones. And that is what the shank bone is all about. It's not broken and it's there to understand the flesh that was given to us and of course the bones that were supposed to be of a perfect lamb that were not broken. Then we have bitter herbs. <laughs> In fact, uh, you know, I, I want you to look at the, the options that we have. We have in the bitter herbs, we have lettuce, which is a little bitter when you eat it all by itself. And we've got the radish. Now, we've got the radish that has some beets in it. So that's why it's red, as you can clearly see here, because trust me, when you eat the radish all by itself, man oh man, it is not going to end well. And so the Jewish people are mixing it with some beets, and that's why it's a little red, as you can see. That's red radish. But the idea of the bitter herbs, of course, 
is to remind us of that slavery we were taken out of, the misery, the suffering, the weeping, the crying. Of course, bitter herbs, uh, not only that they are bitter, but radish brings tears to your uh, uh, you know, eyes when you, when you eat it. And uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 and 38, He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Not only that, those elements on the plate spoke of the bitterness and the agony and the slavery and, and, and the stress that the Hebrew slaves were in Egypt, but even throughout the first century when Messiah Jesus was on that day, hours before his crucifixion, he felt that very, very well. And, um, you know, then we move to this amazing thing. You know, uh, I want you to take a look at this matzah bread, okay? This is an unleavened bread. Take a look at it. It has stripes on it. Look at it. And it has holes in it. Now, the, the Jewish people today mistakenly think that bread is the problem. They mistakenly think actually that flour is the problem. Actually, we don't serve anything with flour right now. Because we think that flour is the problem. But honestly, the flour has never been the problem. The people of Israel had flour. They had water. The thing that they could not use was, of course, it was the, um, uh, the uh, seor, uh, uh, um, leaven. leaven, excuse me, the leaven. Exactly. Thank you. The leaven. Leaven. And we know that a little leaven, of course, we, we, know, it, we know what it does. It makes things sour. Chametz in Hebrew is from the word sour, chamutz. It has nothing to do with flour. This is a matzah that is made out of flour and water. And take a look at it, because this is something that is a great symbol of the... First of all, it's the unleavened bread that they ate. They had no time for the leaven, to, for the yeast to rise, of course. But of course we know that leaven in typology is a symbol of sin. It starts small and it just swells up and it grows and it rises and it takes over you. And it, it makes everything sour in your life. And unleavened bread is a symbol of pure, sinless life. And unfortunately... It ended with stripes and piercing on it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, um, in fact, in Luke chapter 22, he says, verse 19, He took bread and he gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to them saying, can you imagine Jesus taking unleavened bread and he broke it and he, and he said to them, take it. And of course, what do they understand? Okay, that's the matzah bread we eat every year. But this time he says, Take it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't that interesting? He's not giving them his body yet, but he's explaining to them that evening, the body has to be broken and the body is being given to you. Of course, the, we're not cannibals. We don't eat flesh of a human, but the most amazing way to symbolize the sinless life of Jesus and the sinless body of Jesus is that unleavened bread. The Jewish people are actually having a wonderful tradition that most of them are not even aware of its meaning. They put a stack of three matzah breads, one on top of the other, and they wrap it in the center of the table. And eventually, at some point, they take the middle matzah, they break it, 
They take half of it and wrap it and hide it, and the, the other half is still staying here. And we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. That's what the matzah bread is all about. Remember one thing. The Bible says that when the Messiah will come back, the Bible says in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah in Hebrew, it says the following thing, and I will say it maybe also in Hebrew, and he says, Veshafachti al Beit David ve'al Yoshevei Yerushalayim ruach ren v'tachanunim, ve'hibitu elai et asher dakaru, ve'safdu alav kemasped alayachid. And I will read it now in English. I'll pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Who is that only begotten son? Who is the one that was pierced on our behalf? Who is the one that this matzah bread is a symbol of his body? And those piercings that you see here, all these holes in that matzah bread are a great reminder, not only of what happened 2,000 years ago, but on the fact that based on that which happened 2,000 years ago, they will recognize him when he will return. This is the prophet Zechariah. These are the prophetic scriptures that Jesus, through the prophet, excuse me, through the apostle Paul in Romans 16, talked about how the mystery of the Messiah is now being revealed to all the nations. Here you are. You are. You understand. This had to be broken. These stripes had to be given or taken or, or, or upon him, and these piercing had to be there, and. That is, of course, that Passover that was given for us. Then, of course, we have something very interesting. Take a look at this. is roasted egg. Egg is always a symbol of a specific sacrifice that every Jewish holiday was sacrificed. It's called Chagiga, celebration. And the reason why this is a roasted egg, and by the way, let me give you a tip. The best way to reach that brown color is to boil water with tea bag and put that, uh, that uh, egg in it. It will look very, very dark. And um, this roasted egg is, of course, the reminder that maybe the temple had celebrations and sacrifices, but what happened to the temple? It was destroyed. You know, right here, 25 years ago, I got married. I got married here. I had 600 guests. I don't know what went through my mind when I uh, invited that many. Uh, and uh, one thing, I remember I was a fairly new believer. I was only about five years old believer. I was such a stubborn person. I said, I will not do anything that is just traditional. I want to do something biblical. And so I refused to take part in a very ancient Jewish uh, custom of what? What happened to the Jewish groom when he is about to kiss his wife just before that? He's breaking that glass. And he declares that he will never forget Jerusalem, of course. And all of that to remind us of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. I, I didn't do that because, look, the Bible talks about the temple, as, as you all know, uh, and, and I'm reading now, in Matthew 26, 61, Jesus, uh, 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 somebody said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Of course, referring to the fact that he's going to die and resurrect on the third day. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22, the Bible says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. All of you guys. I want all of you that are not Jewish right now, all of you, raise up your hands. If you're not Jewish, yes, <laughs> I guess all of you. And now I want you to understand, I'm talking to you right now. It says you are no longer, you're listening to me, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on what? 
the foundations of the apostles and the prophets are, look, the scriptures, the apostles and the prophets, not on experience, not on some situation, not on some modern days uh, people that come and, and say things that come to their mind. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, those who wrote the gospels, those who wrote the epistles, and the prophets. Remember, you know, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said that manifestation of that mystery of the Messiah is, is of course, him when he came in the scriptures of the prophets, the prophetic scriptures. And the Bible says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach himself, being the chief cornerstone in him, everything stands. You take away the chief cornerstone, boom, everything collapses. In whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Holy temple in the Lord. You see, the temple in Jerusalem may have been destroyed, but we are together today. Not only that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, we together, built together, we built together a whole building, joined together into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That which was old was broken. We are now new creation and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Then take a look. We've got the parsley. This is an amazing thing, guys. This parsley is a reminder first of the hyssop that the children of Israel dipped in the blood of the lamb and they sprinkled on the two doorposts so the angel will recognize them. But also it is a reminder of Moses' staff that hit the Red Sea as the Red Sea parted. And in order to do that, what we do, we dip the parsley in a little bowl of salty water. Water with salt. Now why? Water with salt not only reminds us of tears, but also reminds us of the waters of the Red Sea. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Parsley is also an important thing. After the parsley, we've got an interesting mix of nuts and dates and apples. We call it charoset. It's actually, it's actually pretty tasty, but it looks uh, not too tasty. It, uh, I, I don't want to say what it looks like sometimes, but I can tell you that it's supposed to remind you of mud. Take a look at, at this thing right here. This, this brown thing next to the radish is the charoset. And the charoset, of course, is a reminder of the mud bricks, that uh, uh, the clay out of which our forefathers made out bricks to, to build huge cities in Egypt. And I want to remind you, in John 14, verses 2 to 3, in my father's house are many mansions, he says. If it was not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. See, I, you know, these may have been a reminder of the bricks that the Hebrews built then, but take a, think about all the things that are being built for us right now. And he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may also be. I want you all to take your finger and point at yourself. And I want you to look at this charoset and say, somebody is now preparing a place for me. And because he goes and prepares a place for me, he will also come and take me and receive me unto himself. Not where I am, he will be. Where he is, we will be. That's, of course, the picture of the rapture of uh, our church. And then, of course, 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through our Messiah. Then, take a look. This is wine. This is, a, it's a, I guess, a sweetened red wine. Um, I'm not promoting alcohol right now. I'm just telling you, there are four cups of wine that we consume. I'm not going to drink 
four Thank cups you. of wine tonight or else I'm going to have to need an ambulance to take me out of here by the end of this evening. Um, I have very low tolerance to alcohol to begin with, but I just need you to understand that these four cups of wine are a reminder of fourfold um, uh, things that God did uh, to Israel in Egypt according to Exodus 6 verses 6 and 7. And I'm reading, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And then he says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. And then I will take you as my people and be your God. Four things. And remember, 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 remember. There is the redemption in the second, the judgment in the third, and of course to take us in the fourth. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when the Passover came and Jesus sat with his disciples, he took the first one. We, 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 uh, we, we know that he gave them the second one. But then the third one, from some strange reason, he did not take with them. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane to take it all by himself. That was the cup that he said, if it's possible, take that cup from me. That's the cup of judgment that he had to take upon himself alone for us. The first cup, of course, we know is the cup uh, of um, rescue from Egypt. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He took you, rescued you. The second cup, of course, uh, we see Matthew 1, 21, and uh, she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Yoshia, michatotem. Isaiah 35 says in verse 4, Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with a red recompense of God, and He will come and save you. You see that saving is there. The third cup, remember, the cup of judgment. Titus chapter 2, 14. He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own people, zealous for good works. And of course, the fourth cup is John chapter 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And of course, there we're going to drink that fourth cup in that beautiful, beautiful time. This is the moment, ladies and gentlemen, where um, we are going to um, um, stop. And um, just before we start our Passover itself, Yaron Cherniak is going to sing to us his first song. Yaron? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to sing sure. and what is it that you're using to sing it with? Sure. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this special moment. And, you know, this uh, feast is so rich with, uh, you know, meanings and symbols and songs as well. And the verses I chose to, to start with is, are from uh, Hosea 6, Hosea. verse uh, 1 to, six, uh, to 3. And the reason I chose those verses is that they have a very fundamental ingredient that we see throughout the Bible, which is returning back to God, returning back to the Lord, you know. This is something we see uh, as a very fundamental and basic part of the, of the biblical yes. narrative. Um, through it says, through that Genesis, me, exactly. I will, I will so, uh, Hosea uh, 6, verse 1, Lechu v'nashuva el Adonai, yes, let us return to the, to the Lord. Because why? Because He will heal us. He will, He promise and He shall fulfill. Wow. You so. almost got your doctorate in m yeah. musicology, I think. It's on the way. On the way. Uh, and you're playing a very interesting uh, uh, yeah. instrument. What is it? Three this strings one. only? Yeah, three double strings. This one is originally from Turkey. It's, a, it's called Saz or Uzun Saz. It's a long neck Saz. Wow. Uh, Saz in Turkish language means instrument, music instrument. And basically what we have here, or, or even the composition for this, those verses, 
is based on a very ancient approach to music, a model music system, wow. which is much more ancient than our tonalic music system that we use today. Um, so anyway. So hearing this song will we'll take us as far as we can to the first century with the <laughs> instrument and the, the lyric, of course, are biblical and the music mm -hmm. itself. Lechu vena shuva el Adonai. 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 Ki utarav. Vair paeni, yach ve yach ve sheni. Lechu vena shuva el Adonai. 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 Yechayenu. Veneda, Yudefa, Lada, Teta, Dona, Veneda, Yudefa, Lada, Teta, Dona, Veneda, Yudefa, Lada. Amen. Didn't you like it? Wasn't that so special? Look, that's as biblical as it can get, music-wise, instrument-wise, the sound, the song, the lyrics. Beautiful. Let us begin our Passover Seder. Are you already back home? Okay, this is when we begin it. So far, I just explained of the different elements on this Passover plate and on the other things that are here on this table. At this point, if you have all the ingredients, if you have all the symbols, we shall begin. So let's start with the first cup okay. of wine. I'm going to uh, open this bottle. Again, I'm not here to promote alcohol, and I'm not here to make people, of course, drunk. But remember, there is a meaning to every one of these cups of wine. Um, 
course, uh, wine is not necessarily as alcoholic as it was then. Uh, excuse me, then it wasn't maybe as, as, as alcoholic as it is today. Uh, but I can tell you that this cup of wine is the first cup and we raise our cup together. And uh, we are saying the traditional blessing, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Bore Pri HaGefen, which uh, we say, blessed are you, uh, Adonai, our Lord, the Creator, uh, the King of the Universe, who uh, uh, created the fruit of the vine. This is, of course, the first cup, if you remember that. And that's the first cup. And let's uh, also read Luke chapter 22. 2,000 years ago, around the table, Jesus himself took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourself. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then Mark 14, 23 says, Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, just what we just did, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. Let's drink from the first Ooh. Oh, I better drink a little bit less uh, in the other three. Uh, yeah, that was the first cup. This is the point, ladies and gentlemen, where we are doing something uh, very, very interesting. That's the point where normally we are washing hands according to the order of the Passover. And by the way, guys, if you have not uh, received our... PDF file of the Messiah in the Passover Seder where we explain everything. You can always um, email to us uh, to info at beholdisrael.org and we, will love, we would love to send it to you personally and where everything is being explained. The next thing we're going to do is the parsley, as you can clearly see. The parsley, we dip the parsley in salt water. Remember, we need to at least have three things in order to complete Passover. It's the Passover, uh, you know, the Passover sacrifice, which we don't have. And we have bitter herbs and the matzah bread. So now what we do, we take the parsley and we are um, blessing. Blessed are you, Lord, the God, King of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the earth, not the fruit of the vine, priha adama. And what we're going to do now, we are going to dip this parsley in the salt water and we will eat it. That's our portion of bitter herbs that not right now. Mm -hmm. Now comes one of my favorite parts of the Passover Seder, ladies and gentlemen. The Jewish people, for the longest time, they don't really quite understand why traditionally they have three matzah breads stacked one on top of the other. The whole compartment here has three, uh, the, I mean the whole thing has three compartments with the matzah breads. And according to the tradition that we've got, we have for the last at least 2,500 years, look what they, we normally do. We take the matzah bread and uh, we take the middle one there are three of them remember and when you ask a Jew uh, what are these three for and he says the priest the Levites and the rest of the people but I have a problem with that because we take the middle one and we break it so what's the point of breaking the Levites unless it's not about the Levites so we take the middle one from from right here and uh, apparently I hid it pretty well. And look what we are doing. The middle one is the only one that we take out with the vide. And look what we are doing with that half. We're taking, um, we're taking another new compartment. We take that half. We wrap it separately. It's called afikoman, and we hide it in the house somewhere. Later on, the kids will have to run. We don't have egg hunting. We have afikoman hunting. 
and uh, they have to find it. But the reason why I think it's beautiful is when we look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the only one that had to have his body broken is, of course, the Messiah, the Son. And the interesting thing is that half of him is revealed to those who receive him, and he is still hidden from his own people. Most of the Jewish people around the world and in this land do not know him. They have not yet found him. The Bible says, we just read in Zechariah, eventually when he comes back, they will see him whom they pierced. But it takes a birth from above, as Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born again, born from above. And Nicodemus says, how can that be? Should I go to my mother's womb? And, and Jesus said, you are a teacher in Israel and you don't know that? Salvation is not by affiliation. You know, you have to, everyone is born of the water. But you also have to be born from the Spirit. And when a Jew finds his Messiah, that's when he finds that treasure for which you get reward, the Afikoman. And so, it is normally being kept away from the rest of the family until the end of the evening. And the children, of course, are, um, of course, they are, uh, that's the funnest part for them. I would like to read to you about the, that part. Romans 11, 11 says, look, I say then, have the Israel stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. Through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I want to see a huge smile on your face right now. Because salvation came to you. And now through the fact that you've been saved, you need to provoke them to jealousy. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Romans 11.25 says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I think it's amazing. All of you now, the thousands of Gentiles that are watching it right now live, you're fulfilling an amazing prophecy. The fullness of the Gentile has to come in. There's a, a set number, we don't know, but there's a set time and there is a set way and there are people that eventually, from among the Gentiles, that once they hear the gospel and they respond to it and they're being saved, they're fulfilling that times of the Gentiles. And the Bible says that when that is going to come in, be fulfilled, this is when all Israel eventually will be saved. But unfortunately, as we already heard and know from our last production, Israel and the tribulation, those seven years of tribulation that the prophet Daniel speaks of in chapter 9, that last week, the one that the prophet Jeremiah calls it, Sarat Yaakov, Jacob's trouble, the one that the prophet Daniel in chapter 12 says, it's a time unlike any other time in since the nation of Israel was formed. But then they shall be saved out of it. And then Daniel says, all those whose name is written in the book. Now, after we divided the matzah, um, we can clearly see there is another, there is a, t a, a point where we recite. This is the part where we talk to the children. We, we ask them questions, they ask questions, we answer their questions, such as, why is this night different from any other night? All the children are singing, Why is this different? This night different from every, any other night? And this is also the part where we remind them of what happened that night, what happened that time period. And we do some amazing, amazing things, uh, such as we sing songs with them, such as um, we, we read psalms with them, 
we have the duty to thank, Psalm 113, Psalm 114. And we remember all the ten plagues that uh, the Lord sent upon the Egyptians. I'm not going to do it right now. It involves with taking your finger and dripping uh, uh, drops of this wine into a plate and mentioning each and every one of those ten plagues. But then comes the second cup of wine. And that's the time for us to pour one more cup together. Don't overdo it or else by the end of this evening you're going to talk nonsense. This is the time we remember. If you remember, this is about um, a, a cup that uh, was uh, not uh, taken by Jesus. This is a cup that was ignored during the Last Supper. And why do we know that? Because the next cup that the New Testament is talking about is the cup after supper, which is the cup that eventually he instituted with the Lord's Supper. He took the first cup and divided between them. But then the second cup from some strange the cup of judgment, the judgment that originally we talked about that should have come upon the Egyptians and did come, the judgment, this was not part of that Passover Seder that Jesus had with his disciples. He didn't want them to take the judgment because that's why he came. Isaiah chapter 53, the chapter that changed my life, talked about the fact that the Lord put on him the chastisements of us all. All of us have gone astray, each and every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord put on him everything. He took, he bore our sins. He took the judgment upon himself. You know, we read um, in Luke chapter 4, um, and we can clearly see, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened that book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has, appoint, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and the, the eyes of all who were there in that synagogue were basically fixed on him. And of course we know Jesus stopped right there. He didn't continue about judgment. He didn't continue about um, the vengeance of the Lord. He could have, but he stopped, rolled it back, and gave it to the attendant. Because the first coming of the Messiah is not to judge the world, but to save the world. And that is why he needed to take that second cup all by himself, all alone, by the Garden of Gethsemane. The cup of judgment. It may have not been a real cup of wine, but it was the judgment. And it was so heavy, and it was so stressful, that hemotredosis happened to him. That point where blood comes out of your uh, pores and, and, and falls on the floor because the heaviness of this whole, the sins of the world were on him. He said, Father, if it's possible, take that cup from me. Not my will though, but your will be done. He almost like he knew there is no other way or else he would have taken it. There has to be judgment. There has to be price. There has to be sacrifice on behalf of all of those sins that were committed by all of us. Were committed in the past, are committed, and will ever be committed. And of course, he took it upon himself. And this is why we do not see how the second cup, the cup of judgment, was taken in that Seder 2,000 years ago. And it's very interesting because then 
we move to the point in the Hebrew Passover where we call it to wash, washing. This is an interesting thing. At this point, not only that he stunned them by not even sharing the cup of judgment, but at this point, Jesus is doing something very unusual. John chapter 13 recorded that and says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel. Now, I've got this modern day's towel. I'm not sure what that towel looked like then, but I know that he girded himself with that towel. He tied it right unto him. And look what he did. The Bible says, he poured water into the basin. I'm pouring water into the basin. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is, this is where probably, you know, they're going to wash hands, face, or something. But look what he's doing. The Bible says, after he poured the water into the basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And he, he went all the way from the very one next to him, which were on one side John, whom, whom Jesus loved, and on the other side Judas. And then he moved on all the way, and Peter was the last one. Which, by the way, bothered him. But we know he was the last one because they were not sitting like we do. They were reclining on a triclinium, on a U-shaped low table. And they were all on mattresses. And we know that Peter and John were having eye connection. Because John was the last on this side next to Jesus. And Peter was the last on the other side. And Jesus went through all the disciples washing their feet and he reached Peter and Peter, that very, very proud Galilean Jew, he said to him the following thing, you shall never wash my feet. In other words, hey, uh, you're the Messiah, you're the king, you don't wash my feet, that's not for you. And Jesus said, he answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And when Peter heard that, knowing that Jesus is everything in his life, Peter said to him, you sh Peter answered and said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. That's uh, <laughs> everything. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean. But then he said, not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. And therefore he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garment and sat down again, he said to them, do you not know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet. That's a lesson. That's a token of amazing life uh, 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 experience of don't seek to be served, but seek to be a servant. For I have given you an example. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, now look what he says, if you know these things, it's good, but blessed are you if you do them. It's not enough to know. The blessing will follow only if you do. Interesting. At this point, we take the upper matzah bread from the three that we had. Take a matzah bread, all of you, the one that we didn't break yet, remember? The upper one. And... Um, and we give a piece to all the people around the table. You can take it. I'm going to take a, you know, a piece, as you can see. And look what we do. What we do here 
we combine the bitter herbs and also the sweet charoset, that mud-like uh, mixture. We put them together. We combine them and then we eat. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of the radish, a little bit of the radish, okay? And uh, I'm going to take a little bit of the charoset. I'll put more of that. You put them together, and of course you bless it. But I want to remind you, something happened during the Last Supper, during that Passover Seder 2,000 years ago, when he dipped the bread in those things. The Bible says in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And then, of course, the Jews complained on him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. But I want you to remember also when they combined. Um, in Exodus 12, it says, They shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So we eat it all together. Now I want to remind you in John 13 what happened. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. And now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. He's talking. He's writing. And he said, Simon Peter therefore motions to him. Remember I told you, Simon Peter was a cross on the other side of the triclinium. And he motioned. If he's here, he cannot motion. The only place, because of the way they were leaning and eating, they would lean on the left and eat with the right. So if he's here, Simon Peter is here, John cannot see him. But the only way Simon Peter can motion to John is if John is on the right side of Jesus leaning on his bosom and Peter is on the other side of the cross. And he's motioning to him. And he said who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? It's like Peter says, John, ask him what's going on. Who is the traitor? And John says, who is this? And look what Jesus answered. He said, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. That's what we just did. We are at the point where we just dipped the bread. And guess who he gave that piece? Probably he put more radish than the charoset. <laughs> I would do that. Um, and then, of course, um, he, the Bible says, and, after, and having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, after that, Satan entered him and Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Let's eat it. I should have never put so much radish on mine. I'm almost passing out. Okay. Lord, help me. Now comes the hidden piece, ladies and gentlemen. The hidden piece. But before that, this is the point where the Israelis and all the Jews around the world are happy. You know why? This is the point where we all eat our meal. Every family who cooked whatever it is, is now serving the food to the table. And we eat, and we eat, and we eat, and we eat. And we eat so much that we get to the point where we can hardly function and, and complete the rest of the Passover Seder. After the meal, we see that uh, the children are looking for the hidden piece. And I would remind you, John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and who believes in me shall never thirst. If you find me, you'll have everlasting life. Finding the Messiah. 
who had no sin, who had stripes, who had piercing, who broke his body for us, who gave himself for us, so we will have salvation. Finding him gives us eternal life, of course. And then comes the third cup. Remember we skipped the second cup? The third cup is the cup of redemption, the cup of salvation. The third cup is the one that he took after supper. And I'm going to read to you a portion of scriptures that many of you have heard almost every week. First, I'm going to read it to you from Luke 22, but then, of course, 1 Corinthians 11. And as we do that, I want you to understand what we do here in light of Him. Luke 22, 14 to 20, Then the hour had come, He sat down and the twelve apostles with Him. Then He said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, He said, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took that cup, gave thanks, and said to them, This is, uh, take this and divide it. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God. And then he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do it as remembrance of me. Likewise, likewise, he took the cup after supper. See, the first cup was divided, given to them. <clears throat> but then he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup, the third cup, the cup of redemption, the cup of salvation, is the new covenant in my blood. I have to shed my blood. I am the one of whom Isaiah 53 spoke. And I am now giving you a new covenant of which Jeremiah chapter 31 speaks. Brit Chadasha, new covenant, which is shed for you. So that's why in 1 Corinthians, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he writes and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do it as in remembrance of me. Then the same manner he took the cup after supper, the third cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. So the only time Jesus said, I want you to keep doing something in remembrance of me is this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim not only that the Lord's death, but also until He comes. There is the remembrance of the price that was paid for us and the expectation for His return. So in our households right now, maybe Israel is having a matzah bread and a cup of wine, but this from a Seder meal has become for us right now a way to remember the price that was uh, uh, paid, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken. Do that in remembrance of me. So we are, in a sense, partaking communion right now, remembering the price that was paid for us. Let's take the bread eat it. And so take that cup and drink of it. As you can see, communion is not a Christian thing that was invented in Christianity. It is something that was absolutely taken from every Jewish home on Passover. He didn't bring a new thing. He said, now you understand that which is before you. This is, by the way, the point where we remember Elijah, 
the prophet Elijah. Jewish people have a cup for him. They have a place for him. They have a seat for him. Because the prophet Malachi in chapter 4 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And since the Jewish people never received Messiah Yeshua 2,000 years ago, they still have the expectation of who? Of the prophet that has to come before the Messiah. You understand that? That, by the way, many people throughout the, Old Test the New Testament, during the time of Jesus, thought He is the prophet. They thought, okay, maybe He is the one that is going to point at the coming of the Messiah. And we know that it says in Luke chapter 1, in verse 17, He will also go, speaking of John, whom you call the Baptist. Well, he's a Jew, he's not a Baptist, just so you know. He came from a priestly family, not from a Baptist church. But I want you to know that he says, look, He will go before him in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In Matthew 17, if you remember, after the Mount of the Transfiguration, Jesus and His disciples ask Him, Why then do scribes say that Elijah must come first? Why? And Jesus said, He answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has, came, has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. We can see not only that uh, they misunderstood and didn't, did not recognize that John came in the spirit of Elijah, but of course later on, because they didn't recognize that who said, prepare the way for the Lord, they missed the visitation. And of course, they have definitely missed the Lord. The Bible says that uh, the fourth cup is, of course, the cup of uh, blessing. This is for generations the blessing that uh, we always say next year in Jerusalem. But of course, we are already having Jerusalem. This is where we normally read Isaiah 66. For thus says the Lord, verses 12 to 13, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her side, you shall be carried, and be dandled on her knee, as one whom, whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where not only He was crucified, this is where God is going to restore all things. This is where He will bring back the Messiah to have a thousand years millennial kingdom. And eventually the new city will be called the new Jerusalem as well. At this point, I'm going to call Yaron again. We reach the point where this is almost the conclusion where we sing praises. I, I didn't want you to drink from the fourth cup. You can actually drink from it if you want, but... Uh, some of you are already kind of uh, uh, moving from right, right side to another. Uh, but this is the point where we all at the house drink the fourth cup. We bless and drink it. And we move to the latter part, which is Hallel, the praise. And we know one thing which is quite interesting. In Matthew 26, verse 30, you would think that hours before Jesus was crucified, He would... The last thing he would want to do is sing praises. But the Bible says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, all of them, including Jesus. From that upper room on Mount Zion of today in Jerusalem, they went down to the Kidron and went up to the Mount of Olives, to that area of Gethsemane, after they had sung a hymn. Remember the Hallel, Psalms 113 through th Psalm 118. Yaron, you have, uh, to the best of my knowledge, a song 
that fits exactly that portion of scripture? Exactly. So we're going to sing Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign land, or tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his domina dominion. Mm. And it's amazing because one of like the most, uh, like the verses that I really like in this chapter is that the mountains leaped like, uh, like rams, the hills like, uh, like lambs. Uh, why was it sea that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams? You hills like lambs. Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord. And as we are here wow. in the midst of these Judean mountains, and uh, it's just a very special moment to, to sing this yes. Guys, chapter. So. We are right on the hills of the, mount, uh, the mountains of the tribe of Judah, a few miles away from Jerusalem. Emmaus is below us. We're singing Hebrew song from Psalm 114. This is another instrument that I haven't seen. Yeah, this one called Oud. Oud. An Oud. It's very familiar with like uh, uh, Kurdish music, Turkish, Arabic, all, all sort of cultures are using this. And also in Jewish tradition as well. I see. From Eastern. All right. Perfect. Psalm 114. Oh, yeah. בצאת ישראל ממצרים, בית יעקב מאמן מועז, הייתה יהודה לקודשו, ישראל ממשלותיו. You can clap back home. That was Thank Psalm you. 114. Psalm 114. Thank you. Can? Yeah. We're going to do now the last song. And uh, you're up for an interesting treat. Take a look at this instrument that Yaron is now pulling out. This guy has every single string uh, instrument that I've seen. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen that many types. What is this one? How do you so this it? one is called Lira. Lira. Or uh, Lira with sympathetic strings. We have 23 th strings all together. Three strings are mel melody strings and 20 are just sympathetic strings just resonate to the different overtones. So when I play, I have some kind of uh, natural echo or reverb. Wow. And of course, Lira is mentioned in the Bible. 
uh, harp and li uh, lyre or harp and lyre uh, back in the days 4000 years ago there was there is uh, lyres that been found in Iraq um, in actually in, in yeah in Mesopotamia in Ur Kasdim wow. and they found like a 4000 years old lyre uh, it was totally different it was not a bow instrument more like a strumming instrument but over the years it changed and developed into a bow instrument wow. which has the same name um, now i am I'm, I'm trying to think if when david played on the lyre was it w w it's without a bow was so it, it was without a bow it's mainly with like strumming with some kind of yeah. uh, plectrum yeah um uh, why he will he was holding the strings with his fingers and opened uh, the string he want to vibrate he opened the the finger he put the finger away from the string and while he's strumming so then you wow. have the rhythm of the right hand and the melody of the string, wow. of course. All right, so you do it your way, he did it his way. <laughs> Let's hear it. So, this is another new song? Th this psalm is uh, Psalm 116. Wow. Um, maybe you can read uh, Psalm the 116, verse. remember it's a psalm that uh, uh, is part of the Hallel, and uh, this is where the cup of salvation is mentioned. That third cup, if you're uh, the, the cup that he took with them, and I'm reading to you, it says, he says, uh, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he had inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me and the, pa and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. Um, and of course, I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from fainting, from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted, and I said in my, in my haste, all men are liars. When shall I rend what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord, now in the presence of, of His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your uh, maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of His people, in the courts of the Lord of, uh, Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Ah, 
אותי כשמע אדוני את קולי תחן אוני כיתה אוזנו לי ובימי אקרא בחצרו בית אדוני בתוככי ירושלים הללויה בחצות בית אדוני בתוככי ירושלים הללויה Thank you, Yaron. Folks, uh, the last part of the Passover Seder is, it's called uh, uh, accepted, which means uh, we brought the, uh, the offering to the Lord, we brought the sacrifice, or we participated in what He wanted us to do. But thankfully, these are the shadow, and tonight we remember the substance as well. And I believe It is accepted. I believe this is what he wants. Uh, he is not into religion. He is into relationship. The Lord does not desire in uh, any sacrifice when there is no obedience first. So I would like to encourage all of you, hopefully what you've learned tonight connects you even more to what the price that was paid for us was in 2,000 years ago, and to the fact that there is nothing, nothing in the Old Testament that has not been, is not, or will not be fulfilled in the Kingdom of God. We, we know that. We were promised that. And we can clearly see that uh, God loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that he whosoever believed in Him will not perish, but he will have eternal life. Father, I thank you for this uh, amazing, beautiful way to see the shadow but remember the substance. And we ask now that you will help us taking this amazing truth that we've uh, learned today and share it with others so they will, their eyes will be open to understand the wonders of your word. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for the symbols. But again, we thank, for, thank you even more so for the substance. We thank you that you love the world so much. We ask, Father, that uh, you will walk before us and uh, that we will continue uh, to occupy until you come. And we pray for the nation of Israel as two nights from, to, from, from right now, on Shabbat, Saturday night, they'll sit around the table and they will just see the matzah bread, see the bitter herbs, see the shank bone, see the three, the three breads, break the middle one and understand this is a shadow of a much greater thing, that mystery of the Messiah that now is manifested and revealed through the scriptures of the prophets. We ask that you will open their eyes to see their Messiah through all of this. We pray for Israel, we pray for the nation of Israel that is right now in so much uncertainty, the political chaos. We ask your interference, your presence, your guidance. We thank you for your wonderful plans and we thank you that you, you are God, you do not change, and therefore the children of Jacob are not consumed. We thank you and we bless you in the name of the Holy One of Israel, the Lamb of God, but the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, in the name of Yeshua, our salvation, we pray. All of God's people say, Amen. We're going to unmute 
all of you right now so all of you simultaneously can say shalom and happy passover happy passover god bless you shalom and see you next time yeah.